Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. This is the last time I'm going to ask you to support my book, honestly, during the show, because it's during the period where it's really important to us. And if you buy it by midnight tonight, you get almost $100 worth of bonuses. We will send you, if you email us, either your receipt or a screenshot of your receipt, Rashid, a seat to Chef AJ Bonus at yahoo.com. Bonuses, which include three exclusive cooking classes. They are two hours long with a PDF of the recipe that I actually do sell for $25 each. And the audio files of the book, which is going to be on Audible soon. I don't know what they're going to charge, but that's why we say almost $100 worth. It's a brand new book. It is the 10th anniversary edition of the original Unprocessed, but it's been updated with beautiful colored photographs of brand new forward by Dr. John McDougall, 30 brand new recipes and updated recipes where we could include lower fat options. So thanks so much for your support. And the email is chefajbonus at yahoo.com. If for some reason you don't get it within 20 minutes, just contact our support at help at chefaj.com. So the world is going crazy and we have to keep our sense of humor. And if we don't, we're going to go crazy with everyone else. And comedy can actually keep you sane and it can actually solve all your problems, believe it or not. And who better to explain why than a very funny stand-up comedian or comic. I'm not sure what they prefer these days. We'll ask what's more politically correct. My personal comedy coach, Carrie Otis. How you doing, Carrie? Hi, AJ. Thank you for having me. I really oh love being it. I wish we could have had the pre-show on because you were cracking me up. I was, you, if you're no other reason, people should take your class because once you get on a rant, you're hilarious. That's fantastic. I'm glad to do that anytime. Uh, and I want to just give a shout out to you because there's so many people that um, I've, I've met that have benefited from your work. And uh, uh, I, I, there's so many people I know who are suffering that uh, they could just use your, if you were their personal chef, uh, all, all my friends' problems would pr probably be uh, taking care of all their physical ailments will probably be taken care of. Well, thank you. And you don't eat exactly like me. I mean, I know you're not really a junk food eater because we've even talked about like when you eat pleasure trappy food you don't feel your best but you came to my house for dinner not too long ago and you actually enjoyed it of course it's you know it's, it's just like i normally eat except without a few things you know like um yeah you don't have to mention you don't have to mention it what those things are but things that make sounds <laughs> things that make sounds when they're alive <laughs> but we had tostadas and i can't remember i know you we had a whole bunch of different desserts I've never left your place uh, full. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I never left your place that it wasn't full. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not a Freudian slip, actually. That's hilarious. No, so, you, anyway, enough of me. Yeah, um, so what, do you, what do we call you? Are you? A, I know you're a teacher, of course, but do, do, what is the problem? I, I, I say stand-up comic because I'm too lazy to say comedian. Uh, it just saves me a couple syllables. The thing about comedy is you're always trying to be efficient, and comedian is you know, two extra bites. Well, just say comic. Well, because with comedian, you could say comedian, like you could make it male or female where comic implies either sex, right? You know, when, in, in my school, you know, like when, when I was coming up in the 70s, 80s and 90s, you know, a comic's a comic. I don't care if it's a, a man or a woman. We don't, you know, to say comedian is like, uh, come on, she's one of the, if she's funny, she's one of the people, you're, you're, you're all doing the same thing. That's funny. Well, even the screen actors, it's like they don't say act. Well, but actually, do they say best supporting actress now? An actor? I guess they do, don't they? I think if you're serious about it, you call yourself an actor, no matter what, you know, male or female. And if you can do the job, you're doing the same thing. Um, I think uh, you're lifting the heavy weights. Give it, give them the same name. Nice. Well, you know, um, uh, maybe people don't know that I've been dabbling in comedy for years, but a lot of people said they would take the class if they could take it with me. And there are a few openings left in the five o'clock class that Charles and I are going to be taking on starting on Thursday. So tell us a little bit about the class, how long it is, how it works and why it would help somebody that even doesn't have aspirations to be a comedian. Well, you know, I've been refining this class for uh, 15 years now, and it's a seven week class plus a showcase. They're two hours. It doesn't go on too long. It used to be a three hour class. We've really compacted it, made it a lot, a lot more fun, a lot, and just the so it doesn't drag on. So two hours starts at se, uh, five o'clock on Pacific time, uh, ends at seven o'clock Pacific time. They go every Thursday, starting the seventh, and then. Uh, when we're done that Sunday after the last class, we do a showcase at five in the afternoon on Zoom for all your friends and family, and you get a chance to perform what you've been working on. 
Um, and you do have an option. You know how yes, like we do. Go to, I remember Mag I think it was Magic Mountain. I don't think they have this at Disneyland, but on the really scary rise at Magic Mountain, I can't even remember. Maybe it was called the Revolution. They had something called the Chicken Escape, where like you got to almost the front of the line, and if you decided you didn't want to do it, they let you leave. And so now I think it helps a lot of people to know that nobody is going to force them to perform. If they get to week seven and they decide to opt out, there is no pressure from anyone to perform. And just so you know, um, if you if it freaks you out too much, know that you don't have you don't have a gun to your head. And e I will never let anyone I've never let anyone uh, go on that wasn't ready. Um, if there's anything that goes up and goes on that makes you not ready, uh, what I often do is just work with you privately until you are. And if you decide after that, no, nah, still not ready, then we let you out. Is um, the showcase after week seven or after week six? After week seven. So week seven goes all the way to May 19th. So that means the showcase must be the 22nd. Exactly. Okay. At five o'clock. Good to know. Because you know what? Even if I chicken out, I'm happy to host it on my Zoom if that'll help you. But One of the things that's fun to watch is just you in the classes, AJ. You are a, just a great addition to the class because you are hysterical in the moment. You, you don't think about what you're going to say and it just comes out. And I just keep going, oh my God, that's the best. Yeah, that's what I love about improv, I think, because you don't think about it so much, whereas comedy, it, it, it is, the, the moment is so much, such a fun place to live. Yeah, well, and what stand-up is, a lot of people think, oh, how do you, how do you write comedy? Well, what a lot of comedy is, is noticing when you're already in the moment ex accidentally. You might be with friends, you might be complaining with someone in the back room at work, and you, you, you let something spill out of you that's natural. And what a comic does is they harvest that. They remember it. They go right to the, their notebook or right to their phone and they dictate it. So they have it again. So it's uh, about being in the moment, but then preserving it and using it again. That's the difference between a comic and a civilian. Yeah. Do you think anybody can be funny? Well, I think um, there are people who probably are clinically unfunny. You know, I haven't really met them um, because most people... If you work with them the right way, you can find something funny to be. They may never be a professional comedian. That's not what this course is about. And, not, you know, only one in, in 500 might have what it takes to really go on and do comedy professionally. But everyone can be funnier than they already are. And everyone can come up with a few funny observations and put them together into something that would be a very, very nice five minute set. Um, not everyone has the same talents coming in, but that, there's more to it than that. Even if you're just miserable in life and you bitch really well, that can be hysterical five minutes. Yeah. And so, some people are funny without even realizing it, I think. That's it. A lot of people are funny when they're not even noticing it. And then what I have is uh, I, I pay attention to what's really going on with the person. And, and it's kind of almost like a little Zen thing where I find which way to twick twist their uh, perception of things so that it comes out the right way. A lot of people might be mad at their spouse and I go, well, um, you know, you married her and uh, they start coming up with their own problems. And then you suddenly you're on their side. No one wants to hear you bitch about somebody who isn't there. So we end up turning it on ourselves, turning our sense of humor back in the mirror. And that's where we get a lot of great stuff. And it's OK to be self-deprecating in comedy, right? You just don't want to be attacking somebody else. Exactly. And self-deprecating can be just nice. You don't have to beat yourself up, but just be honest about um, I, I wrote one of the things that why comedy can solve your problems is because we spend so much of our time trying to seem cool to everyone else, so, to seem not screwed up, to hide our faults. And what comics do is they lay their faults out right out front. They just go, hi, I cannot get stuff done. And, and so instead of pretending you're busy, you just thought, I'm totally inefficient and name your problem. And everyone suddenly is laughing with you and you go, why was I worried about saying that to everyone? That frees up a lot of my time now. I don't have to cover up my faults. I can name them what they are. And, and people will, will recognize I do that too. It was so interesting watching Linda Middlesworth in the class because I kind of almost forced her to take the class because she what did. I saw in her was somebody that was hilarious every minute, but she didn't know it. And all it took was a little bit crafting of the material, what, she, what was coming out of her mouth. And I, I, I mean, for somebody doing it the first time and the second time, I thought she was like a pro. Absolutely. And one of the things that Linda was so wonderful to do is, you know, I know so many of your um, your uh, fans are, are vegans, obviously. And uh, one of the things that vegans can be is a little self-righteous. And we talked about that. And that can make people put off on something that's really a lovely thing. Right. Because no one wants someone to be telling them what to do or be pushy. And Linda was so willing to make fun of herself 
And if uh, she didn't have to be less pushy, but she said, you know, I'm pushy. I'm an annoying vegan. And, and it was so delightful to hear her say that we suddenly softened to everything she had to say. So now she becomes this delightful persona on stage. And right. she had the courage to do that. I just, I just salute her endlessly for that. It's sort of like if a comedian comes on stage and they have like a, like a physical, uh, you know, like something that other people are going to say, they, they need to claim it like, duh, right? Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've had, uh, uh, this wasn't a student of mine, but back in Denver, uh, back in the 80s, there was a comic with one arm. And uh, he walked on stage. The first thing he said, been kind of a wacky weekend. This happened at the petting zoo. <laughs> Llama my ass. So immediately gets a joke, right? And everyone feels relaxed. Oh, he does know he has one arm. Okay. And he's cool with it, right? Oh, my God. That's hilarious. Yeah. Very fun. Well, uh, uh, go ahead. The people that, I sent, you know, not everybody obviously watches every, every episode, but we did a couple of shows with a guy named Pete Sobey because we uh, we wanted to get him a, a wheelchair equipped van and anybody that donated to our Indiegogo got invited. They didn't know about this because we didn't want that to be the reason they donated, but they got invited to this private show that you were so kind to contribute your time to. You performed Steve Middleman, Wendy Liebman. And, you know, it just was like, that's what's so cool about comedians is they come out, they, they show up for people like that, you know? Well, we, we love to perform and, and I love to perform with people that are great. And, you know, you to have Wendy and, uh, um, and Steve there. It's just, it's like going home. It's, it's just like having the, uh, um, all your buddies together. And I, I, I love seeing funny people. I, I, I wanted to see what Wendy was doing these days, you know, and I, and I wanted to see what Steve was doing. So it's, it, it, it's a treat. You know, I know I was thanked, um, your friend thanked me and I said, we did this for, our, we had so much fun and don't thank me. You know, I feel like I, I, I've got a lot more out of it than I put in. Um, that's to, to have something you enjoy doing that be your life and that be your career. It's, it's a blessing. Um, but what I want to do is what, well, every time I'm on stage having a ball, I go, this is so much fun. I wish, I, I wish other people knew what this felt like. So that's why I love teaching it to others so that you guys look past, Oh my God, that looks scary to this is the most amazing experience you can have. It, it's so empowering. It's so delightful. You feel so affirmed. You feel like, Hey, I just showed everyone what's wrong with me and they like me more. How cool is that? And to feel one with a crowd, to have them laugh with you is just such an astonishing feeling. I mean, you love it, don't you, AJ? Well, when it works, I mean, you know, as long as I'm- Oh, being, there I don't we like, go. Yeah, I don't like it when I'm being heckled. I have never really been heckled in stand-up situation, but in performing I have, and that doesn't feel so good. Do you teach us no. how to- um, how yes. to mitigate that when like, it happened to me, believe it or not, of all places, a $5,000 a week spa called Rancho La Puerta. And they, that they were embarrassed actually. I, you show me the video to that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah, that that's when you're not expecting it. Um, but you, you know, you, the first thing to do when, when something like that happens is to just make sure you're centered. All right. The first thing to do is to notice you haven't been hurt. All someone said was words. And the first thing to do is kind of emotionally let that go by. All right. It's kind of like a martial arts thing. If someone throws a punch, the first thing you do is like, move your head. You ever watch a martial arts movie or, or any kind of movie where the guy boxes and you, you think he's going to punch him in the nose and the guy just ducks out of the way and the, and, and the punch doesn't land. That's the first thing to do emotionally is, is go, that guy's just shouting stuff. I don't know how to take it personally. Somebody else, you suck. You don't have to go, how did he know? All right. That's taking it personally. That's thinking that guy's not just shouting, but he's he's naming a true flaw. First thing is go, wow, look at you shouting. All right. I mean, we talked about this before uh, we went live today, but, you know, in the Oscars, um, the first thing that uh, uh, Chris Rock did was go, wow, Will Smith just smacked the crap out of me. You know what I mean? That's the first thing he said was it, it distances you from the event. He didn't say, why did it happen? He just went, wow, look at that which is a, a, another way of saying I wasn't really hit emotionally. Okay. So you, you got to, um, if someone were to yell, AJ, you stink. You, you don't you know suddenly like, do I? You just go, oh, look at you shouting. Oh, you know, that's what, how comics often deal with a guy. Like I remember my first beer. That's a, it's a classic, you know, kind of old, old style retort. It's just saying, look at you shouting. Oh, that's great. But well, it shows you. Could this help? I mean, I'm, I'm not a parent, but there's a lot of bullying that goes on. Can, can, could, 
could comedy help somebody being bullied or Yes. It, well, one of the reasons I was funny as, as a kid is because there were some kids who were tough around me and I, I just made them laugh. If, if you were funny, then, uh, you know, they didn't really pick on you as much. But when it comes to if someone says something to you, you don't have to you don't have to fight back. You can just go, well, yeah, yeah, my nose is kind of big. See ya. You know what I mean? Now they, ha- they haven't connected. you. They haven't bothered you. You've just gone. You've just. Um, uh, kind of let the joke fall, let the insult fall off of you because you need to be cool to come back with a joke. You can't get hurt and come back funny. You need to let it fall off of you and then just go. Uh, it, what, it's, what? it's sometimes hard not to get hurt. Like Lori says, this is great advice for when people make jabs at us for being plant-based or losing weight, realize they aren't hurting us. Right. And, and the first thing to do is not get upset. If you start going, they don't understand how wonderful I am, then you're going to, you're going to, anything you say will come back upset. All right. It won't be funny. Like, yeah, not only, uh, not only a vegan, but I'm also, um, you know, something else. Just say something even weirder about yourself. You know what I mean? Um, uh, let's see. What, what could... Well, like, you know, okay, so 10, I've been thin for 10 years now, but before that, somebody actually said to me in a class, 77 people in a cooking class at Whole Foods Pasadena, and Mm -hmm. he raised his hand. And so I just assumed he was going to ask a question, you know, like about the recipe. And he literally said, if the vegan diet is so good, why are you so fat? And I did get angry and hurt. And like, what could I have said? You, you have the line, you know, the line, cause you've used it on yourself. Well, now I, I would say, I don't know. It must be something I ate. I mean, I don't know. You know, no, you had a line, you had a line that I think um, it came out of your own mouth. Cause this is how I know it. You're like, yeah, I'm a vegan, but I also love chocolate. Mm. You know what I mean? And you've, you've said that before about why you were overweight, even when you were a vegan, cause you liked, you liked chocolate. Mm-hmm. And so that's all you had to say. But you first had to not be hurt to rem- to have the the bandwidth just come up with the with the rest of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's hard though when you're reactive. But I I, I see your point. So Karen has who's watching live. Karen's been in the class twice and she did fabulous. She said, oh, yeah. "I'm seriously if thinking of doing the comedy class again. If you do, Karen, I hope you'll take the five p.m. because there's a class at five and seven. And Charles and I we can't take the seven because it's past our bedtime." Karen asks. What does Carrie think is funnier, hair loss or constipation? Oh, those are the be- they're both fantastic. Um, actually, um, you know, I, I've, I've, I've suffered from hair loss a lot more than constipation. Uh, but um, I think constipation hurts more. I mean, the, the, uh, hair loss is every day and it kind of you don't have to look in the mirror, but constipation is just uh it's a more serious topic. Constipation is more universal because not everybody can relate to hair loss, but I think everybody can relate to pooping. That's true. That is true. I don't know that I go for either of them because they, they don't really, um, I would hope that um, out of an audience of a hundred people that only one might be constipated at any given time. Uh, if there's 50 constipated people in my audience, there's a problem that we need to talk about before we even get to the show. What have you been eating? Do you take in any fluids? What's your fiber intake? What What the hell's going on? Are you eating ball bearings? What is it? Something's wrong. Um, balding, the balding to me is the weirdest thing because it's the one thing that um, you can still make fun of somebody for. You know, you can't make fun of someone if they're disabled. No, they're handy capable. But if they're bald, like, oh, his head is, his head is shiny. And uh, there, there's no one defending. There's no, like, uh, the bald defense society or something like that. You know what I mean? Well, it's like, probably will be soon. Yes, now there will be. It, has comedy gotten harder because <laughs> there's so many things you can't say now? I, um, I'm glad I'm not in the clubs today. I'm glad I, I did my, you know... I did my three decades when people, it was a little more sane. Um, and I, I don't know what it's like in a club. I'm going to be going out soon to just try it, uh, to see if it's, uh, if it's too, uh, um, too tenuous, too thin ice. Um, I think people though, there's always going to be enough people that just want to have fun and that still remember how to do that. It just, seems, it just seems so unfair because some people get canceled and some people don't for what I would think are more major offenses. Well, the beauty of stand up in a club is there's only there's only, you know, 50 to 100 people there. You're not you're not doing this in, in front of the universe. 
So you can say something and control it in that small little womb-like atmosphere. And if somebody's offended, you can deal with it right there in the moment. When it's going off into the internet, when it's going off into uh, either broadcast TV or your blog or whatever, you don't know where it's going to go. Uh, and that's a little too hard to control for me. I, I don't feel as comfortable with that. I love looking at all the faces of the people that I'm messing with. Yeah. Anybody here uh, want to take the class? Lori, how about you? Lori has a YouTube channel and I think she's adorable. I would love to have her in the class. Well, that would be fantastic. Yeah. You get to hang out with me for two hours and Charles and Bailey. We got to get Bailey into the act. I know. I just, gosh, I just got to teach her English. I know. I'm sure she's funny. Yeah, it's so fun. The class is so fun, guys. It really is, even if you don't end up performing. I hope we can get Linda back. She's not watching right now, but I've been texting her. Yeah, and to, just to watch AJ just lose it, go on some weird rant. If you have a bad day, AJ, that's the best. I should record those. Those should be my act. You know, it, it's... um. I think for anybody that like, like Lori, who has a YouTube channel, anybody that's out there at all on social media, I think this class is a must because it really teaches you about being in the moment. And, and, you know, especially because, you know, we have comments that are written about us on our page and it just, I think it just helps us. Right. Now, let, let me just go down. That I, I made the broad claim earlier that comedy can solve all your problems. And I, I really think it's, it can, it can change your life. All right. First of all, comics have to think of life from a different angle. Everyone looks at it this way, but you ever look at it this way? And that can really open up your life. Because if, if you get hooked into habits of normal, you know, vantage point, you'll never come up with new ideas and new ideas give you new direction and, uh, and kind of let you escape the old traps you've been in. It helps for uh, business, even if you're just trying to brainstorm, learning the, uh, how comics think can help you in, in creating new business solutions. There's a, a, a book uh, by a, a Dr. Edward de Bono called Lateral Thinking that's all about this kind of stuff. And comics do this without having to take a thousand dollar seminar where I learned it. Um, it. Comedy, as we said, teaches you to take yourself less seriously. And if you can do that, you can slip out of all sorts of weird ego problems. If people think you're not taking yourself seriously, then they 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 might trust you more because you, you don't have a fragile ego. And if you have an error in front of your, your co-workers, you don't feel devastated and you don't try to cover it up. People who don't cover up things, people trust more. Um, if you uh, look at things that people usually ignore, comics are always looking at the things you never noticed but have been happening right in front of you. That makes you um, more attentive and it gives you an edge in business or in your personal life. You're learning to be in the moment. Comics are always right there. We don't ignore the moment. You ever watch somebody's speech and they're just droning on? You go, what? I'm so bored. And they're bored and you're bored. But if you're in the moment, you go like, hey, I've lost you guys. You sleeping? You go, oh, yeah, sorry. Let's connect. Now you connect as humans. Comics are reconnecting with the audience every 12 seconds. We're saying a line. We're getting the response. If we don't get it, we correct it. So there's no one falling asleep in a comedy set. If you learn those skills, your presentation skills in business or in conversations with people will always improve. And lastly, when you're, when you're funny, you've got to learn to be relaxed because you learn to let go of fear. And you realize when you're relaxed, you're much more quick. You can come up with unusual responses. You come up with better ideas and you're safer. So the, the bigger risk you take, the safer you are. What we think of um, being safe is like, I'll just read off my page. People do a speech in public and they read off the page and everyone's bored. That's safe, but it's not working. Whereas if you speak right to the audience right in the moment, then you connect with the crowd and you are truly safer because you are succeeding. Okay. That's my spiel. I've spieled you. What's the difference between like, comedy and telling a story because what I see in the class a lot of times what happens especially people that are new is they they don't want to tell a joke they or they want to tell a joke like a knock-knock joke but that's not what stand-up is or they want to tell this really long story right and I I don't teach storytelling although I've been you know you know the moth radio hour you ever hear of that mm -mm. Okay, that's a, you should look it up. It's uh, the best storytellers in the country kind of competing um, uh, with spoken word stuff. And I've, I've met a lot of those guys and, and done shows with them, with, with professional storytellers. It's an art, but it's not an easy thing to do. I, I can't teach storytelling because most people don't have a knack for it. They just go on and on and tell these endless stories that don't have any point. 
but stand up makes every word count. Um, and if you if hear, it seems to be a story. It's still in stand up. It's sequential, um, uh, sequential jokes on a timeline. But there's jokes every twelve seconds. There's jokes every second line. Every second sentence ends in laughter. Um, it's easier to do like a sequential um, series of jokes on a topic than to tell a story. Most people stories are just rambling. Uh, I've heard you ever hear a, you ever hear a little kid try to tell a joke where they don't even know what the point is, and then a guy kind of just uh, that's that's what most people's storytelling is like. It's just rambling. They don't know what the point is. So I, I, what I hear when I hear somebody's story is, let's take the, the core of that and turn it into a joke. And then we'll add jokes on top of it. And then you'll end up with five jokes in a row. I know that's hard to say without giving you an example, but that's what we do. Got it. Is there like, can you give an example of like the quintessential comic as far as like if somebody's studying and wants to learn, who would you say to watch? Oh, oh there's so many people that I love, uh, I love to watch. And there's different, you know, datelines of different types of comics, you know, like uh, David Steinberg in the 60s or um, uh, uh, Bob Newhart. These guys took their time on a joke. Those were, those were different clubs, you know, that you, they were playing. Those people that were theater audiences and they sat there and they had suits and ties on. Nowadays, um, who would I say? Quintessential. I, mm, you know, if I say Dave Chappelle, I would say Dave Chappelle, you know, before he got quite as edgy as he is right now, not, not because he's bad now, but because it, it, it can... Um, distract from the art form of what he's doing. Um, I, I can't think of the, I, I can only think of 20. I can't think of one name of just watch somebody that appeals to you. Watch anyone who, who's like, well, that's, that sounds like me only funnier, you know, um, or who I'd like to be. Um, God, you know, Leno used to be a, a, a comedy God back in the eighties, but you know, when he went on, on the Tonight Show, it became a little more of a suit and tie thing. He used to just be in jeans. Um, uh, Gilbert Gottfried was hysterical, but I don't know who I'd tell you to study. Sorry, it's a simple question you asked, and I don't have an answer. That's like saying, what's your favorite food? If you only eat one food forever, what would it be? I don't know. Well, you know, it's interesting because nowadays, you know, it's it, it, you can be shocking and it's not shocking anymore because everybody's, you know what I mean? Like back yeah. in the day, like if somebody said like, like did an F bomb, maybe like, whoa. And now it, it does, it words don't seem to have the same charge, but don't you think it's, it's, um, I, I, I let me, I don't, I want to, I don't want to say this in front yeah. of you, like, I don't eat salt. I don't think salt is healthy. I get why people like it, but as a chef, I think it's literally the laziest way to season food. Like literally, like really, that's all you got. And I think that when people just swear a lot, to me, it's almost like the laziest way to do comedy. That's a perfect analogy. I love that, AJ. And um, that is very, very true. When, when comics watch other comics, we're looking at, is that innovative? Is that well-crafted? Is it interesting to everybody? Uh, are they delivering it in a, in a way that is engaging? Are they keeping the crowd going? And all of those things, you know, uh, we're, we're watching that on a very, uh, very detailed level. And when I see somebody like uh, Jim Jeffries, all right, he's got a bit on gun control that is masterful. So that would be something I would say, study that. Watch what he's doing as an argument, as jokes, as connecting to the crowd, as a way of corralling people from the left and right together. That, that's like a brilliant, brilliant piece, all right? So that's one I could say, I, I should have answered the other question before, who would you say to study? Watch, watch Jim Jeffries do some stuff because he's, um, he's brilliant, but he's hiding it behind, I'm just a drunken, crazy guy from Australia. So he's not arrogant about it, but he has these great arguments. They're, they're well, well, well crafted. Um, anyone who's just, if, if you need to swear, you might not have been working hard enough to get the right word. And once in a while, yeah, you need a curse just to get it across. Um, but it's, it's rare that you need it. Um, and especially when I started out, you wouldn't make any money if you swore because you couldn't work any of the, any of the jobs that would, would want to pay you. So, you know, uh, I, I can't I can't believe how people can get away with stuff either on cable or in, in uh, late night shows that encourage that kind of stuff. 
And people don't want to hear as much dirt as you think. I was invited to a show that was full of storytellers. It was actually called Naughty Tales. It was like at midnight at a, at a festival and it was supposed to be dirty, but they didn't want it that dirty. They just wanted it titillating. And the beauty of suggesting something that's dirty without saying it is you can make people just laugh because it's happening in their head. I've done shows in churches and you say something kind of sexy, but watching a nun laugh is the best fun because you said something that's kind of dirty with, to, to get an, a nun to chuckle. That's an art form. Who are you talking to, AJ? You, you got some texts in there? Oh, yeah. I was texting Pete to tell him that, to watch you live, that we're live with Carrie right now. Gotcha. When did women really start coming into their own with comedy? Um, there's always been women doing it. You know, and I, I started in the seventies and there were comics, uh, you know, Judy Tenuta was working with, uh, uh, at the top of her game back then. Um, and there were plenty of, of women doing it. Elaine Boosler, you know, she started in New York in the seventies, um, and, uh, Rita Rudner and all that. So there's always been, uh, amazing women doing it. Tony Fields was doing it in the sixties. Um, as, as, as well as, um, um, what's her name? Um, sorry with the, with the hair, who's the crazy uh, Phyllis Diller. Um, uh, but I would say in, um, in the eighties, there started to be a lot. And now there's tons, just tons of great women comics. My friend, Pam Stone, uh, she started in the, in the mid eighties or so. Very funny, very talented. I worked all over the world with her. She took me on a tour with her of, uh, of Europe. Uh, with Miller Light and uh, very smart, very competent. Uh, you know, uh, I, I just, I think there's a, a lot of amazing women working now, but just like you said, some, some people are getting drawn into the dark. In other words, uh, you know, to hear nothing but vag men doing dick jokes and, and women doing vag vagina jokes is just not what I was interested in doing. I, I wouldn't have done that as a career if, if that's what the, the tone of the rooms were. Um, cause I don't find that, that interesting. Well, back, like when I watched Mrs. Maisel, is that accurate? How like the comedian or the comic would be used just kind of between the burlesque act? Well, yeah. And that's, that's an, a, an interesting thing to talk about that. Um, the, when I, I started in this comedy boom that started in the, in the mid to late seventies and comedy was a whole nother, it was a new form. And before that, it was it was a, a, burla, a, a vaudeville kind of, you know, but I'm, you know, where the, I, I did shows in Chicago um, at old venues. Like I was doing a police benefit on the north side of Chicago, or I also did a, um, a veterans a, a show. And there was a drummer ready to do rim shots. When the comic was introduced, the drummer came up to do the rim shots. And it was just. What? But you realize you were at that transition point where in the in the late 60s, early 70s, it was still that style that has been left over from Broadville and burlesque. In fact, Judy, Judy Tenuta used to do some strip clubs. That's where she learned a lot of her uh, um, her timing and, and, and got a lot of power. She got a lot of work in strip clubs. Timing is everything, isn't it? That's what they say. I never learned it myself, but uh, I hope to someday. Yeah. Well, this, I hope people will, uh, Diana says, I think I am funny. My therapist tells me I am. That's hilarious right there. If, so you if are. You, your therapist did. <laughs> yes. Um, listen, what I want to say about this, uh, the reason you and I are talking today is because we'd like to do a little something at five o'clock on Thursdays and have fun. It's not, it's not some sort of death challenge, you know, or, um, you know, like, you'll never be as frightened, but you'll never, have as well. it's just us having fun. I love hanging with you, AJ. I love hanging with Charles and Bailey. And we, we're just going to have some fun and, and uh, tell stupid stories about our mistakes in life and turn them into jokes. That's all this really is. It, yeah. It turns into a show later, but just come and have fun. If you feel like it, then we'll do it. If it doesn't turn out, uh, then we'll do something else. Well, somebody, was it you or was it that the, the, you took over uh, Judy's class? Well, that's how I met you. But one of you said that comedy is just tragedy plus time. That, that predates either Judy or myself. That's that comedy is, is pain plus time. Um, so, yeah. I mean, and, I did a whole set about, you know, having, a, a, you know, four miscarriages. And I mean, yes, it was sad at the time, but when I did the act by then, it was hilarious. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we don't, we don't want to see you still in, in, in turmoil, you know? Um, and I, 
uh, it's a delight to come out of an experience and kind of celebrate it with some comedy. Oh my God, Karen Gaylor signed up. Oh my God, yeah, I love having her in class. This joke that she did last time. Yeah. I don't want to give it away, but that in case she wants to use it again, that was hilarious. We got to get Linda back. Linda, Linda's, Linda's, Linda is... Linda doesn't have to do anything. She's hilarious. But just to get her like real, all we have to do is just like um, corral her. Well, AJ, you know, most people who are in the class because of you are there because you badgered them. They, they're, um, you are the best uh, cheerleader for anyone. Um, and I really appreciate how you uh, you can gather a crowd. I, I bet you um, we could just throw you out in the street and you, you'd gather a crowd for us. Wow. You yeah. know, I, I actually, I have a friend that recently had a stroke and I, I don't know if she's at the point of rehabilitation, but this might be something that she would consider. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We've, it, we've definitely done stroke humor before. Yeah. Uh, about, about, about the person, not us making fun of people with strokes. Just no. be, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just because you can take that. Look, we, we, we do a lot of stroke humor. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. no, It's always, uh, always strokes, uh, always jokes about whatever we're going through, not what somebody else is going through. That's, that's a great thing about comedies. It teaches you where the comedy really is. A lot of people um, don't know where to look. They think, oh, I'll make fun of that guy and that guy. And that guy's short. I'll make fun of him. Like, no, make fun of yourself and it'll all work out. Yeah. Diane says humor is the best medicine. It's true. Like, I mean, remember Norman Cousins who laughed himself out of cancer? You know, I love to laugh. I don't have TV anymore, uh, but TV didn't really make me laugh anyway. It just made me depressed. But, you know, when I do try to watch something, I try to watch something very light and very funny. You know, my first uh, comedy uh, act back in Chicago was uh, I'm, I'm not just a stand up. I'm also a paracomedian. I go out to the scenes of accidents with the ambulance and try and lighten things up. Because people take their own injuries much too seriously. Yeah. Could you imagine if a paramedic was a stand-up comic? That would be hilarious. I would love that. We, If anyone is a paramedic and they're listening, please come and take the class. I definitely want to hear that. That would be great. Well, this is so much fun. If you guys thought this was fun, multiply this by 10. And the fun that we have when we're privately together and can say whatever we want on Thursdays is super duper fun. Uh, uh, and AJ, I want to thank you for uh, all this, uh, enth the enthusiasm you've been bringing to th this class for years has been a delight. I think I met you in 2005, I think. Really? You know, it definitely was after 2000. I'll have to look that up because I'll see when my first appearance is. Um, yeah, Karen says, we, we yes, we have. Having a stroke was one of my funny things. You know, I always say you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And if you ever had a desire to do this and you don't have to perform, this is the best place to get started. It's safe, it's nurturing, and it is hilarious. How do you top that? Let's just- Yeah. So if they want to register, the link's below. It starts this Thursday, April 7th. There's a class at five to seven. There's a class at seven to nine. That's my bedtime. So I'll be at the five o'clock class with Karen and Pete and Charles and Bailey and whoever else shows up. And uh, I hope to see you there. Thank you, AJ. Well, thank you, Carrie. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. You have six more hours to get the bonuses. It really helps me out if you buy the book early. It helps me out if you buy it. But really, when you buy it now. And please come back tomorrow at 10 a.m. for McDougal Mondays, where Dr. John McDougal will be talking about hypertension. Can we make hypertension funny? Let's try. Okay. But better, better for you to have it if you're going to make fun of yourself. All right. Thanks, Carrie. I'll see you Thursday. And I'll thank all of you. I'll see all of you who sign up.